Frank. I'm the director here. And I just want you to know that we had over 150 RSVPs today. You guys are the ones who the hardiest made it out. In the Darwinian world, you are the fittest. <laughs> so thank you very much for being here in spite of the weather. And uh, I know you're going to be very glad that you came. Uh, I just want you to know if you have not found a way onto our email list and you'd like to be notified of events, please leave a card or write out your information for us at the front desk before you leave. And other than that, I'm going to turn it over to our colleague from the Miller Center. Sid, you want to come up? I lived in Boston for 13 years, so it didn't seem like that big a deal to me. But I know, I know in Washington this is a big deal, so I, I really appreciate you being here. I'm Sid Milkus. I'm a senior fellow at the Miller Center. I'm also in uh, the Department of Politics. And, and I have to say this is a, a great honor uh, uh, to be here and to have the opportunity to work with Michael and my, my old friend uh, David Brady and, and the Hoover Institutions. Um, I am uh, really also grateful uh, to uh, Bill Anthalis, uh, who's the director. Is Bill here? Where's Bill? Well, he'll, oh, there he is. <laughs> I'm really grateful to uh, Bill Anthalis, the director, my boss at, at the Miller Center, uh, uh, who's given me this opportunity to put this uh, conference together with, uh, with the Hoover Institution and uh, Stanford. And uh, Stephanie Abbott, I have to thank. Stephanie, where are you? Oh, there she is. Stephanie is the Associate Director of Presidential Studies, and she's just amazing. <laughs> we, uh, we, we did some brainstorming to pull this together, but she sweated all the details. Now, this is the second day uh, of, of the conference. Yesterday, some of us met in private uh, uh, at Montpelier. Uh, we were trying to uh, get inspiration uh, from the spirit of James Madison there uh, to brainstorm uh, about the fascinating and thorny issues that shaped the 1918 election and the fundamental challenges uh, that these political times uh, pose to America's constitutional republic. And uh, those who were part of the Montpelier uh, summit, many of whom are on this uh, first panel, panel will distill uh, what we learned yesterday and then carry on uh, the discussion with fresh voices at this more public meeting. Uh, and I, I just want to say something about the way we go about uh, d these kind of discussions. Uh, I think what distinguishes the Miller Center and our allies at the Hoover Institution um, from the crowd seeking to make sense uh, of the last week's midterm is first, uh, you, we're committed to examining the 2018 election uh, in broad strokes. So we want to take a look at it in historical context and also in a broad institutional context. And second, we like to mix up scholars and real people. Um, who we, whom at the Miller Center we lovingly call practitioners. And uh, some conferences I know to segregate these people. Okay, it's time for the scholars. <laughs> now it's time for the real people. Well, well we, we mix it up. <laughs> uh, we operate without a net. And so we're going to have a conversation today uh, between academics and, and practitioners. We have two panels um, sequenced in logical order. First, we're going to talk about the 2018 congressional election and do a postmortem. And then on the second panel, We'll talk about the next two years, and maybe we should call that a pre-mortem. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see. So let me introduce uh, this uh, terrific uh, panel, panelist. Uh, they're very distinguished, but I, I w if I uh, gave them a proper introduction, it would take up the whole hour. So I'm just going to, their pedigrees are in your, uh, on your program, so I'll introduce them very quickly. Uh, we have Jennifer Lawless, who is, uh, it's very important I mention a Stanford PhD, but now she's ours. She is my new colleague at the University of Virginia in the Department of Politics. And she is, and I'm not just bragging here, this is a fact, uh, she is the foremost scholar of women and politics. Next, uh, we have Mark Short down the end there, who's also a new colleague of mine at UVA. Uh, since last August, he's been a, uh, a see, we call them practitioner. He's been a, practi a <coughs> practitioner senior fellow uh, at the Miller Center. And Mark is going to provide insights from his experience in the Trump White House as Director of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs. We have Maggie Haberman, uh, the Distinguished Pulitzer Prize winning White House correspondent uh, from uh, the New York Times. And I told her I'm a little starstruck uh, because when I come home at night after spending hours studying politics, my wife thinks I need to watch more about politics. <laughs> so we watch cable TV, and, and I get a chance to watch Maggie on, on D Lemon, as he's called now. <laughs> by, Chris, by Chris Cuomo. Uh, and then uh, we have Doug Rivers, uh, who is, uh, teaches and does cutting-edge survey research at the Hoover 
uh, institution. Uh, uh, and uh, he's also a professor of uh, political science uh, at, at, at Stanford. And he's, he, he also is um, an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. And what jumped out at me about Doug's very distinguished resume is he won Executive of the Year in, in 2000 by a group that calls itself the, Re the Research Business Report. Uh, I never had a chance to introduce a colleague who had won Executive of the Year award. And then last but not least, our, uh, quiet, David, I'm introducing you now. <laughs> La last but not least, we have our pri Primus Inter Paris, our first among equals, who will moderate the panel, uh, David Brady, who is the Bowen, uh, H. and Janice Arthur uh, McCoy, professor of political science at Stanford and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. And he has this great combination of being brilliant and feisty. And I, I love that combination. He's, he's, a, he's, he's a great scholar of elections, parties, and government institutions. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, David. Thank you. And thank you all again for being here. Thank you. So two comments. I've uh, asked two questions for this panel. What happened in the elections? And then who are the winners and the losers? What does the election mean for Trump, Republicans, House Democrats? I've allowed everybody on the panel to answer whichever question they like, except my colleague, Professor Rivers, who's going to start by talking about what happened in the election since he led the uh, YouGov uh, CBS 160, 320,000 survey. Uh, one separate little uh, message, uh, Jen Lawless is a friend and a colleague. She, in January after the election, I told her, stop watching CNN, stop watching TV 24-7. She's failed to do that. And she told me today she was very starstruck to be on a panel. Like on a CNN panel, right? She now. felt as though she was in, in, her, in her living room. So she's, whatever, whatever she says, Jen's not going to disagree. So I just want to make sure you all knew that before we started. So, Doug. Good morning. Um, so Dave told me to stick to a little bit of data. Uh, so here are 10 slides worth of data. Um, the first thing about this election, at some level, it wasn't a surprise. If you watch the polls, uh, the outcome was about what you would have expected. The Democrats took the House. The Republicans kept control of the Senate. Um, there was a lot more polling about the House this year, including a monumental effort by Nate Cohn at the New York Times, uh, which produced lots of district-level numbers. Uh, so we, we had a pretty good idea which districts were in play and which weren't. Uh, Democrats, it looks like they're going to end up doing a bit better than expected in the House, and Republicans may be a bit better in the Senate, though there are still quite a few races uh, undecided. Um, so, um, there was one big surprise in this election, and that was the level of turnout. Um, my current estimate is 117 million ballots uh, cast, which is over 40 percent higher than uh, 2016 turnout, uh, the highest midterm turnout uh, in half a century. Uh, you know that that is truly surprising. Um, if we look at what happened over uh, the course of the campaign. Uh, around Labor Day, the Democrats had roughly a 10-point enthusiasm advantage. We asked people whether they're more or less enthusiastic about voting in this election than usual. And typically, Republicans have an enthusiasm advantage in midterms. Uh, but the Democrats started the campaign um, with an advantage there. Uh, then over the course of the campaign, roughly coinciding with uh, the uh, Kavanaugh-Ford uh, hearings or Trump uh, going nuclear on the campaign trail, the Republicans started to catch up and eventually um, uh, seemed to have exceeded uh, Democrats slightly in enthusiasm. Uh, so insofar as there's a story about turnout, it looked like Democrats were going to have a great turnout uh, and maybe Trump made up the difference, though you could also argue that he also brought out a lot of Democrats who otherwise wouldn't have voted in the midterm. In terms of how people voted, uh, it was pretty much enough to know what they thought about Trump. Um, so um, if you, uh, this is daily polling uh, uh, over the course of the campaign. If you look at, at Labor Day, about 80% of the um, uh, Trump disapprovers said they were going to vote Democratic, and that rose to around 90% by Election Day. And if you look at Trump approvers, you had more or less the same thing. Uh, they uh, started at around 80% support for Republicans and ended up uh, around 90. Um, so nothing terribly exciting there. If you 
followed the day-to-day -day, uh, estimates. We were doing daily estimates of the number of seats in every, um, the vote in every race. It was really boring. It was just a flat line. Um, longer term, uh, what's happened? Um, so this is daily polling uh, over the Trump administration. Uh, the green line at the top there is uh, strong disapproval of Trump. And what you see is that started in January of 2017 at about uh, 70%. Um, and it was relatively flat going up to high 70s. Uh, and then during the campaign actually went up uh, above 80% among Democrats. Uh, so not a ton of movement, but a little movement in terms of more disapproval of Trump uh, among Democrats over uh, the two-year period. All right, this is Republicans, and there's a little more action here. Uh, the blue line is strong approval for Trump, and the red line is somewhat approval for Trump. The thing you normally see reported in the newspapers, um, which has Trump at, in the neighborhood of 40% approval, is a combination of strong approval, approvers and somewhat approvers. Um, and what you see here is that over uh, roughly the last six to nine months, strong approval among uh, Republicans for Trump has gone up significantly to now where it's about 75%. And that's largely come from people moving in the somewhat approving category. That is, Republicans have become more enthusiastic about Trump, um, and it really started uh, in the second year of his presidency. Okay. Um, so what's underlying this? Um, this is a standard poll question that's been asked forever, uh, which is, uh, do you think the country is headed in the right direction or is seriously off on the wrong track? Uh, we ask this weekly in our polling for The Economist. Um, and um, what you see among Democrats is, uh, since the beginning of the Trump administration, we've been seriously off on the wrong track. I think that's about 75%. Um, and on the right, you can see Republicans. Um, and um, the blue line is headed in the right direction. The red line is on the wrong track. The, um, the wrong track numbers um, peak at the time among Republicans around the time of Charlottesville. Um, and since then, it's just been a trend up where Republicans now think uh, things are headed in the right direction. Uh, so what you have are essentially Democrats and Republicans in terms of their view of where the country is uh, completely polarized. I don't think that's any news, but uh, when it happened seems a little odd, um, or maybe not so odd, depending on your explanation. So, you know, is this just because the uh, right direction, wrong track question is another way of asking about Trump? Um, so we also uh, do an economic evaluation. So I ask people, do you think the economy is getting better uh, or worse? Um, and this is data uh, dating to the beginning of the Obama administration into the Bush administration in uh, 2008. Okay, and so in 2008, we were in the midst of the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. Um, and uh, uh, before the election, Republicans didn't see too much of a problem. Uh, after the election, they did realize suddenly that we were in a financial crisis, and the picture was flipped for Democrats. Obama gets in, and um, we're doing great. Um, and the same thing happened in 2016. Uh, that is, partisans are now, their evaluations of the economy um, seem to reflect partisanship rather than what's really going on. Um, uh, you know, it's as if they're observing parallel universes. Um, uh, so it's no longer it's the economy stupid in elections, it's, it's the party stupid. Um, Dave says I have two minutes, uh, so I'll very quickly give you kind of the uh, demographic splits in the uh, electorate. These are from the exit polls, they're somewhat controversial because there's some questions about the accuracy of the exit poll on this, but they're directionally correct. All right, so the biggest traditional split in American politics is on race with uh, African Americans, uh, Latinos, and now Asians being significantly more democratic, a uh, gap that has roughly been constant over recent elections.
um, in size. Uh, it was 9% in 2014, 12% in 2016, 10% in 2018. Uh, so contrary to all the stuff you've been hearing about you know, suburban women and so forth, the gender gap actually didn't change much. Um, suburban women are swing voters in the sense that they go from Democratic to Republican or vice versa, and elections tend to swing that way. But everyone is swinging. Uh, so it wasn't a, a swing different among men and women. That came out slightly wrong. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, okay. Um, the big story of the 2016 election was the education gap, which I take as a proxy for working class versus the elite or whatever. Um, but it's the difference between college educated voters and non college voters. That had been running on the order of six points in recent elections. If you go back 25 years, it was zero. Um, and then in 2016, it almost tripled. Um, and you know, what happened in that election is the Democrats had a coalition of minorities and educated, affluent people in cities. Uh, and Republicans essentially were their traditional evangelical base and uh, white working class voters, particularly in the Midwest. Uh, that actually swung back a little bit this year. Uh, one of the untold stories is that the white working class to some extent came home to the Democrats, uh, which will present real problems for Trump in 2020, trying to carry the Midwest states that he needs. I'm almost done, Dave. Um, and then the last one that's uh, really controversial is the age gap. Um, so typically, younger voters tend to go with whoever is winning the election. Well, they went in a big way uh, in this election for the Democrats. Um, there are some estimates that it was as much as a 25-point Democratic advantage among 18 to 29-year-olds um, and a 25-point Republican advantage in over 65, uh, which is a 50-point gap. Um, and the effect of that is, uh, because older people tend to die and younger people don't, uh, is that over time, if that persists, uh, it's a big advantage for the Democrats. <laughs> and I'll, I'll leave at that point, uh, skipping the last one. <laughs> okay, um, I have no slides, and I have three points, and they're all about women. So the first is that despite the fact that this was framed as a year of the woman and a set of circumstances like we've never seen before, what Doug just highlighted about the gender gap and how it wasn't really that much news is actually similar to some of the results as well. Um, before the election, overall, about 20% of the United States Congress was comprised of women. And after this incredible year of the woman election, where we've elected far more women than we've ever seen, we're at about 22.5%. After these final races are called, we'll probably be at 23%. Now, typically, we only see an incremental gain of about one percentage point. So put into – oh, my God. I'm loud, though. You probably heard me anyway, right? You heard me anyway. I'm very loud. Um, <laughs> It's a problem. Um, <laughs> so put into broader perspective, uh, you know, a three percentage point increase is substantial, but it certainly doesn't reflect, I think, what the public's expectations were. Uh, another reason that it wasn't much of a story is that in every presidential, I'm sorry, in every congressional election dating back to the early 80s, women have fared just as well as similarly situated men. So women on both sides of the aisle in primaries and general elections have done just as well. Female incumbents almost always win just like male incumbents do. Female challengers almost always lose just like male challengers do. And when you're competing for an open seat, you've got an equal shot if you're a man or a woman. Women also have historically, at least for the last 30 years, raised just as much money as men on both sides of the aisle. Uh, the second point. Something that was different is the lopsided ratios of women that the parties sent to the House is really quite incredible. Uh, generally speaking, between two-thirds and 70 percent of the women who serve in Congress are Democrats. When the new Congress convenes, that number is going to be 86 percent. And that's not that surprising given that 42 percent of Democratic candidates in the general election were women, compared to only 14 percent of the Republican Party's candidates. What that means is that women's electoral fortunes are now disproportionately linked to the vagaries of the electoral environment. 
And by that, I mean that when the Democrats have a bad year, there are now a disproportionate number of women that can be pulled out with them. We saw that in 2010, where the Democrats actually suffered a net decrease in the percentage of women serving. And then the third point that I would like to make is that I think we are probably heading into a time where there are going to be unrealistic expectations for the women who are new to the House. A lot of them campaigned and a lot of the media perpetuated this general idea that women are more likely than men to be problem solvers in a bipartisan way. And there's actually no evidence to suggest that women are any more bipartisan than men. And so I think they believe, and I have no reason to doubt that, that they're going to go to Congress and solve these problems. But the partisan constraints of the institution make it very, very difficult and don't provide any incentives for people to cross party lines. The fact that 86% of these women are also all on one side of the aisle decreases the likelihood that they're going to cross party lines. They're going to be able to build coalitions in the majority on their own side to get a lot of stuff done. So it was generally a good year for women. It was a good night for women. I don't want to suggest that you know, we fell below expectations. The problem is that the math is such that we can only make as much progress as we can if only one party is really prioritizing recruiting and running female candidates. And we can only make such headway when the partisan constraints of our political institutions make it that the D or the R in front of your name is way more important than the presence or absence of a Y chromosome in your DNA. Thanks for having me. Uh, I will be much shorter than either of you um, because I think you've heard who voted uh, for whom. Uh, and I think that the answer as to why is uh, a combination of demographics and a referendum on the president. And I think what was unusual about this president's, uh, this president's approach to the midterms was um, it was a direct contrast to what we saw President Obama do in certainly in 2010 and also in 2014, where he largely stayed away from uh, almost any race where he could be at all uh, controversial or, or you know, anything more than a net positive. Um, this was a president who wanted to campaign in places where he probably wouldn't be helpful. There was an internal debate, for instance, about some advisors who are perhaps less familiar with politics wanting to send him to Michigan, where he would not have been a tremendous help. Um, but he certainly did inject himself into a number of these races and uh, in a way that, you know, in, in more rural uh, districts, it was, uh, and, and, you know, deeply red states, it was helpful. And then in states with uh, large cities and a lar large suburban populations, it wasn't. Um, and so what this means going forward, you, you know, you've all read lots about pending subpoenas from uh, a Democratic Congress. I don't actually think we're going to know what that looks like in terms of these investigations until we know who the Speaker of the House is, certainly. And then after that, uh, until we know where they're going to stack their priorities uh, and what their voters are going to uh, tolerate. I think there's a large appetite among the Democratic base for um, pursuing investigations that the Republican-held uh, Congress did not. And so uh, where that ends up, I'm not sure. Um, I think it will be this president's instinct to try to come up with some kind of bipartisan framework where he can reach deals with Democrats. Uh, again, I don't know how much appetite there will be for that. Uh, you know, it, it, we've made lots of jokes about every week being infrastructure week. Um, infrastructure week may be coming back with a, with a vengeance um, once we get into January. Um, I think that at the end of the day, I, I think that the, the desire to sort of give Donald Trump a victory that he can point to for 2020 is going to weigh very heavily um, on, on Democrats, particularly Democratic senators who are considering campaigns of their own for 2020. Uh, and so what this all uh, means is unclear, but what I think a, a likely possibility is uh, not a ton getting done over the next two years governmentally. Um, the president will do what he can do by executive order, and uh, and then I think that he will uh, be stymied in, in, in any large-scale deals. Uh, you know, I know that they're trying to push through criminal justice reform right now, uh, in the lame duck, Mitch McConnell has left himself an escape hatch, and I don't, I don't know that it's going to get through. There is still some uh, objection to it within his own, within his own caucus. So, um, so that's what happened, and I think what it means is, uh, is gridlock. But we'll see. Well, a special thanks to the Hoover Institute, Mike, for hosting us uh, here this afternoon. Thank you all for making time to be here on a uh, messy day. Uh, who won? I, I guess uh, you think when it, that question nationally means there's got to be a loser in this. And 
the way that, that I look at it is that there's no doubt Democrats had a decisive victory on election night in the House. And I think that Nancy Pelosi is a historic figure that we have not fully appreciated, not just the first woman to be Speaker of the House, but to have been as patient and persistent as she was when out of power to wait for her time, I think likely to become Speaker again. I think she's a historic figure. Having said that, I think the president also had a challenge in the midterm election cycle. As Maggie said, Barack Obama took a different approach, and in 2010, when Democrats controlled the House to send the White House, they lost 63 seats, a record number. It's not something to jump up and down when you lose 35 to 40. That is a significant loss. But historically, people talk that the average number of seats lost in the midterm is 27, your first midterm. Over the last 100 years, the average number of seats lost when you control the House, the Senate, and the White House is 48. So that is a, that is a different dynamic that, that is, I think, Americans like divided government. And so the challenge to the president then is how can he manage with a divided government moving forward? Looking at the Senate, the president actually, I think, had a profound impact in bringing across several people in North Dakota, Missouri, Indiana, and possibly Florida. Additionally, with the passing of John McCain, the retirement of Jeff Flake, the retirement of Bob Corker, the president has a stronger influence on the United States Senate today than he did before the election. So there's no doubt that Democrats had a significant victory in the House, but I think the president can also look and say, I have a stronger grasp of the United States Senate today than I did before Election Day. One other point um, as far as the strategy of putting the president, making this a referendum on him. Um, I think midterm elections often are whether you accept that as the president or not. And for Donald Trump, there is a percentage of voter who was so frustrated, I think, in 2016 and angry with Washington, D.C. and where we stood, that that voter is not a traditional Republican or Democrat. And the challenge is, how do you get that person to come out in the midterm and vote Republican? So for the president, yes, there were probably House seats that were cost by that strategy, but at the same time, by getting as, as involved as he was, particularly the post-Kavanaugh hearing, in driving that enthusiasm up among Republicans and trying to close that gap of that Trump voter who probably doesn't like Republicans in Congress, doesn't like Democrats in Congress, doesn't like anybody in Congress. How do you help that person say, you know what, I need to go out and support the president's agenda and I need to go pull a lever for Republican, even if I'm not really that excited about it? And I think that that's probably where he managed the downside to help make sure that the losses were not more significant in the House but also to give him, I think, a stronger grasp of the United States Senate. Moving forward, I know it's for the next panel, I probably have more optimism about what can get done because the president is not necessarily a conservative ideologue. He has a strong conservative base of support, but the president always liked the Democrats' infrastructure plan better. The president likes the Democrats' plan on drug pricing better. The president, as you see just yesterday, has embraced a bipartisan plan on prison reform. I think there's several areas that he can work with them. As Maggie said, the question will be, what are the politics that intervene? And will Democrats allow themselves to actually cross over and give the president any sort of legislative victories over the next two years? Thank you very much. So the normal procedure would be for me to ask questions of the panel. Uh, I'm going to pass on that and turn to the audience. Uh, no, I'm not getting paid for this, uh, but hold it. But the other point I want to make is my wife and I have a very tight connection to Dulles in the air, so at 2 o'clock when I leave, it, Paris, it could be, not that, it's, not that Washington isn't superior, but, and so the point is I, I have to leave at 2 o'clock, so I'm going to ask Sid to come up and finish the last two. It could be something they said, but it probably isn't. So, uh, yes. Uh, I, uh, I guess we have a mic. Okay. Uh, my question is, is building, my name is Greg Gross, my question is building on Doug Rivers' numbers, specifically on the issue of economy and party loyalty and how that impacts it, or the party affiliation. You, po you show in your numbers that that started, at least during the Obama administration, reviews the, on the economy were almost seemingly determined by your party loyalty. And I, I ask them to invite the panel to explore why is that the case? Why is it different than it was earlier when economic concerns would actually be independent of party affiliation. Yeah, so just on the data, it really started during the Clinton administration. It's been growing ever since. And it seems to be related to polarization between the parties. 
that is people interpret everything in a partisan lens. Um, but why it happened, I'll let other people speculate. We have a, uh, a couple of colleagues and I, we have a, a long paper with bullet of regressions trying to capture what caused it. And we have measures like with the, the Dow Jones and various measures. The only people who track uh, reasonably well uh, with how the economy is doing by whatever measure, unemployment, uh, Dow Jones, is uh, our independence. And uh, Doug's absolutely right. They began to separate in the 1980s. The gap is getting further, not smaller. The gap is not more Republican or more Democrat uh, as separated from uh, independence. And the answer is, in spite of that 90-page paper and all the regressions, we don't know. <laughs> well, we already we do lie. Yeah, we know it's X. Um, <laughs> Uh, Cynthia Hostetler, UVA Law 88. Um, in full disclosure, I sit on a, um, a number of public corporate boards that are large and involved in infrastructure. So going back to Maggie's point, um, you know, every week it's infrastructure week and then nothing ever happens. And going back to Mark's point, where the president is, is you know, somewhat pra pragmatic, um, Trump has come out and said that he would support a gas tax to, to um, further infrastructure, and the Democrats uh, also support that, at least some of them. But we've got a problem with the caucus in, the, I guess, at the, the Freedom Caucus in the, in the House, the Republicans. Is there a way around that? Uh, well, sure. I um, um, To suggest that the president supports the Democrat infrastructure plan, I don't know, I'd say makes him pragmatic. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't support the Democratic infrastructure plan. I'm just giving you my personal opinion as where I think the president is and what he thinks makes would make sense. And I, I know that he would often look at the plan the White House before on public-private partnerships and said, what sort of math is it that $250 billion all of a sudden magically becomes a trillion? And so he was always a skeptic of that. And I think he believes um, that the Democrat plan of just more deficit spending toward infrastructure is what's needed. He believes that we need a large um, injection of resources to fix a lot of problems that we have in our infrastructure. So I think it, it, is, it is a plan that would go forward. As far as the Freedom Caucus, keep in mind, if something comes out of the House, it's going to come from a Democrat majority. So it's not going to get many Republican votes anyhow. So it would be a Democrat plan coming out of the House that, mer that then goes to the Senate. I think most people would say, how is the Senate, re controlled by Republicans, going to support a trillion dollars in deficit spending? Because they're concerned about the deficits. And my cynicism is that I think Republicans talk a really good game about deficit spending, but their voting record doesn't show they're really willing to actually stand up and stop that sort of deficit. And so I think at the end of the day, again, if you get a bill out of the House, I, I'm suspicious that many Republican senators will say, this is more money for my state, will be supportive. Plus, with the president's push, he has more influence over the Senate today than he did before. I think he can help push it through the Senate. But all that's going to be, as Maggie started, a question of are Democrats willing to give him any legislative victory? I, I, I think Mark said it all. I mean, I think that, again, and, and I'm not viewing it from the will they allow Trump to win versus are they sort of dealing with their own constituencies. Um, I just think that there's going to be a, a natural tension between these two things. Uh, and I, I think that um, I think the things that the president has said that he favored before, uh, he may not favor as we, we head into next year. I just think there are a ton of X factors. And I, I do think that he would like to have something that he can point to as a bipartisan victory. I think that the, the one thing I didn't touch on in my opening uh, remarks was just the the degree to which, on the one hand, uh, wins in Florida and Ohio statewide were positive for the president, the recount aside, um, but because uh, if, if it holds, which it likely will, um, that will be positive for him uh, in terms of 2020. But there were a lot of trouble spots in the Midwest and uh, in the Southwest, and, and the White House is aware of that. So uh, he is going to have to find a way to uh, retool his own approach. Uh, I just don't know what that's going to look like. Can he make a deal? I mean, after the DACA experience? Which part of the DACA, DACA experience are you referring to? Well, he made a deal, and then there wasn't a deal. And but, I mean, depending on who you talk to, there was a deal, and depending on who you talk to, there wasn't a deal. And, I mean, the part of the, part of the, part of the, but, but look, I mean, one of the, I don't want to put Donald Trump on the couch here, especially with Mark here, but, um, the, um, but one of his, one of his habits, and I think he's less inclined to do this now with two years under his belt in office, but one of one of the 
his his uh, calling cards is that he tends to tell whatever group he's with what they want to hear. And so part of what happened with, as he would call them, Chuck and Nancy, was they had a dinner with him, and literally the plan was to get him to agree with them and then go out and announce it, and they did, and um, other people in the White House stopped that. And so I, I don't... Uh, you can get to a deal, um, but it is going to require a lot of people being on the same page and in the same room. Peter Kaplan, uh, college graduate, 1966, and a political science major to, to, to boot. If uh, at the break all our iPhones started buzzing and it said, Justice Kennedy has just announced that he is going to retire, how different would the uh, election have been? You should update your phone. <laughs> Or put another way, I mean, you 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 started on the enthusiasm gap and the, and the change with the Kavanaugh hearings. If, if there were no Kavanaugh hearings, if Kennedy were to announce or announce uh, any time, how different would it have been? Yeah, it's impossible to play the alternative universe story because at the same time the Kavanaugh hearings ended. Uh, Trump increased his activity on the campaign and said some really uh, outrageous things. Um, you know, so I, I can't separate those things, but it, I am on the side of the people who believe that um, Trump did manage to rally the Republican base, and so that helped them. Uh, you can see it in states like uh, North Dakota and Tennessee, uh, which, uh, you know, were really big wins for the Republicans. Uh, in Tennessee, the Democrats had a 10-point advantage in the spring in that race. Um, but at the same time, uh, I don't think helped themselves on in the House, where uh, lots of those were in places that were uh, marginal for Republicans. I would have said hurt him in the uh, Senate, just like he did. Uh, it, hurt, it helped Republicans in the Senate. And in the House, in the areas, uh, uh, suburban voters, et cetera, hurt them. So you got kind of both. And you, can, you can't statistically determine it, but I believe it was very helpful in Tennessee and in Missouri particularly, and then also probably in Indiana and, uh, and North Dakota. Something I would add is that the Democrats had been very enthusiastic for many, many months, right, for a year and a half at this point. And so I think if the hearings hadn't occurred, there was the possibility that fatigue would set in, right? And that was something that the Democrats were worried about. So although it energized Republicans, it also kept Democratic enthusiasm at a level that was, I think, required given the, the heightened Republican enthusiasm. Okay, I don't know if this, oh, there it is. Juliet Iopin with Washington Post. Quick question, you, obviously we, we have a lot more evidence of how Trump has, how Trump influenced the midterms and clearly Democrats were motivated anyway, but there were plenty of Democratic 2020 presidential hopefuls on the trail. Is there, did anything crop up that showed whether one was better at motivating than another? Or, you know, obviously I don't think that there'd be polls that granular, but even anecdotal, things that people have noticed about whether someone made a difference in a house district or anything like that? I don't know anything on the district level. Uh, most pollsters had the good grace not to be running 2020 uh, horse race <laughs> polls, but one did appear the day after the election uh, and basically showed no one getting out of the teens. Um, I, yeah, so I, I don't know the answer to was any Democratic presidential hopeful, helpful in the individual race. This is one of those things that's really hard to tell. You know, the consultants go around and they tell you that races flip. What we noticed is there was hardly any change from 2016. Um, we had a friend of ours who was running in the Indiana congressional race, and um, I would periodically look at what the changes were from 2016 because his internal consultants on his campaign were telling him he was competitive. And we didn't have a ton of data, but literally there were 75 people in that district we polled, and uh, 74 um, were voting in 2018 the way they were in 2016. So it was solely a turnout difference, not a, anyone switching from one side to the other. There's a story about that blogger, the liberal and conservative blogger picked nine candidates and said Elizabeth Warren didn't do very well in that. But 
th those uh, that's not causal. I, I I agree with Doug. We don't we don't really we, we don't really know. There's these stories floating around, but you know you could, that's data you can manipulate, kind of depending upon which side you want to win. Good afternoon, Robert Flock, Credit Union National Association. Thanks for your thoughts today. Uh, there was an interesting trend this cycle where Democratic candidates declared they would not accept corporate PAC dollars. And then you have folks like Beto O'Rourke who are able to raise $70 million plus through Act Blue. Since then, uh, with the House Republican leadership elections yesterday, members of Congress on the Republican side have said they would not support a candidate for NRCC chairman who did not have a plan to replicate those small dollar donors. How does that trend continue going into next cycle, especially with the presidential election? I, I don't know as far as as far as the trend, honestly. I, I think that uh, the president right now has a fundraising operation that is raising significant resources from small dollar donors. There's no doubt that House Democrats were far more successful in that than Republicans this cycle, and uh, they're wise to say we need to have a plan to match that. Um, but I, I think that that's actually the tools are there to do that, and uh, I think that uh, probably um, the president has a way to raise a lot of money for Democrats as he does for Republicans. And so it, that's, that's kind of the, the root of it. So when he's on the ballot, I think you'll see it more evenly matched. No, I think Mark is right. I mean, I think that, um, I think a couple of things. I think that some of the analyses uh, this cycle in terms of fundraising were not great because I think that people were not allowing properly for what you can and can't do with soft dollars that are outside or unregulated dollars. Um, and in terms of the president, I mean, he's he's raised a gazillion dollars already, and I expect that that's going to continue. Um, it's I, I think it's too soon to make an assessment. Well, one just one comment that generally you find that corporate donations are people who are looking to get access, so they're more moderate. The the small donors are ideologues. They're, they're giving the money, so that that rather than bring anything to the center, that that seems to me if it continues drives things for uh, drives things further apart. So that, and that tendency has uh, continued over time. But it's important to note the distinction between the kinds of money and who's giving it. Um, um, afternoon. Uh, given the, that the biggest issues in 2018 were single payer, free college, uh, gun safety, could it be a trend that politics has become, a, become women's work instead of something men will want to go into, much like education and healthcare have become women's work in the United States? So for a long time, there were gender stereotypes about what female candidates and elected officials would focus on, what male candidates and elected officials would focus on, and that's gone away, right? We've now reached the point in time where instead of gender ownership over issues, there is now party ownership, where certain parties are seen as more credible on one issue rather than another. But the opposite party then has a chance to respond. And what studies have shown is that it really doesn't matter whether the uh, whether the legislator is a man or a woman, if the issue matters to the American people and there's a way to, to solve that problem, it has a greater likelihood of being solved. The other reason that I would say no is that this issue environment, there's very little evidence to suggest that the issue environment actually systematically motivates candidates, right? People say, oh, I'm running because I care about X, because you would be appalled if they said, I'm running because I want raw power. Right, so there is this general sense that like you have to have a set of priorities because it resonates a little bit better with the voters. Um, the reality is probably somewhere in between. Um, and the final thing that I would note is, although there were a record number of women running this election cycle, there were also a record number of Democratic men running. So the reaction to the Trump agenda was not only among Democratic women, it was also among Democratic men. It's just that that wasn't a very sexy story. Uh -huh. Hi, my name is Mitchell Fishman. Um, I was a poli-sci major, too, if that's relevant. Um, <clears throat> my impression you know, is... No, we still have some. <laughs> my impression is that um, Heidi Heitkamp and Joe Donnelly and uh, Phil Bredenson and uh, Claire McCaskill all did worse on election night than they were expected to do in the polls that preceded the election at least by some reasonable period of time so that they probably got went down in the last uh, several weeks of the campaign. Do we know if that's correct based on the statewide polls as opposed to national polls? And if so, 
Is there anything that you would say accounted for that other than perhaps the Kavanaugh hearings? Uh, it is correct. Uh, and Joe Manchin did uh, significantly worse than his polls, uh, and Tester maybe slightly worse. Um, so the Democrats running in red states were polling better in the summer than they were at the time of the election, which made people in the summer think it was a chance, not a, ever a good chance, that Democrats would uh, control the Senate. Um, you know, I, I hate to say I don't know again, but in terms of what the causes are, we don't have the data really to say that yet. Uh, I think we're going to have a better idea. Um, but my guess is we're going to find that um, if you look at the summer estimates of turnout and the fall estimates, Republicans turned out better in those places uh, than they expected. It does not seem to be that uh, the Democrats didn't make inroads into the uh, suburban and rural counties where Trump did extraordinarily well in 2016. I would probably say that I think each of those states is a little bit different. Um, I think that North Dakota and Missouri are probably states that have been moving Republican, and it would be very difficult for the Democrat candidates to win there. People need, I think, to recall that Claire McCaskill beat Todd Aiken six years ago in a very uh, flawed candidate at that time. Um, Indiana is the one that surprised me because, frankly, Indiana is a state that went for Barack Obama, and it's a state that elected Evan Bayh repeatedly. And so I'm not sure that Indiana, as, as Republican, is, is the results reflected. So that's one that was an outlier for me, as well as Montana, because uh, frankly, not only is Tester multi-term incumbent, but again, Montana is a state that goes Republican in presidential years, but has consistently had Democrat representation in Congress. So I think each one's a little bit different. And I do think that there's been, I think, um, I don't think there's been enough scrutiny about Chuck Schumer's strategy on the Kavanaugh hearing. Because I think there's been a, a common sense that it did drive Republican vote out. I believe the Democrat vote was about as high as energized it was going to get. And and I respect Jennifer's analysis, but I don't think there's much risk of it really going down. I think their intensity against Trump is so strong that it was going to stay strong. And by having the circus of a hearing that he did, I do think it hurt several of their Democrats in the Senate. The one thing I would add, um, I would say that the Heidi Heitkamp race is a little bit different because right after the Kavanaugh hearings, it became clear, or at least the narrative became, that she knew she was going to lose. And so it could be that part of the reason she lost by more than was anticipated was that she wasn't running the kind of campaign by the end that might have closed that gap two or three percentage points. Uh, Herb Rose, um, after Sandy Hook, when Obama and Biden uh, were committed to making a change with regard to uh, the dissemination of guns in this country, after Orlando, after Las Vegas, and so many more places. Uh, nothing seemed to happen until Parkland, when lots of young students were getting out there. And uh, weekly, you heard stories about uh, uh, the efforts that they were making. Uh, do you think that any of this, and particularly with the Parkland students, uh, did any of it push the needle at all in this election? So, <laughs> if you look in the spring of 2018, gun control pops up as the most important problem. By the time of the election, it's way down the list. Um, so, um, and is that the case of the Democrats dropping the ball on a good issue, or is it because the map in 2018 was such that gun control was not a very good issue for the places the Democrats needed to win? Um, you know, so places like Missouri and uh, Florida, North Dakota, and so forth, that's not a great place for uh, gun control as an issue, and uh, at least statewide. Um, so I'm, I tend to think the Democrats are not going to win NRA votes, and they'd be best advised to stick to their principles on this. Uh, uh, there are more, you know, the fraction of people that own guns is smaller than those that don't. Uh, you just need to energize them somehow. I've decided after evaluating whether I should have interrogated them that I did a better thing by turning it over to you. So other questions? 
Hi, I'm Prashant Rathor, and my question is, has the two parties' dynamics changed? Uh, in other words, is the Republican Party still the party of Reagan, and the Democratic Party, is it still the party of Clinton? No and no. <laughs> it's not even clear to me the Democratic Party is the party of Barack Obama right now. Um, I mean, there are... There are uh, disaffection with President Obama ha has been a, a factor. It was a factor in Sanders' rise. It's been a factor in uh, the election for the last uh, the elections in politics of the last two years. Um, I think the Republican Party at the moment is the party of Trump. I don't know what that will end up looking like in two to four six years, but um, I mean, I, I I don't think I'm stepping out on a limb saying that. Ah, okay, so I, I just wanted to a ask um, about party alignments. And, and taking account of, of perhaps this becoming uh, a, a Trump-centered uh, Republican Party. And um, I'm particularly wonder, I was talking um, to Doug about this before the panel, and, and I wonder what we, we can say enduringly, if anything, about what happened in the suburbs. And if the defection in the suburbs sticks, uh, whether that might be a an important, a significant development in the in in the party alignments, and um, you know, I'm, I've grown reluctant to talk about majority uh, support anymore, or the, um, an emerging majority party, because it it seems like that's the country's been so divided that that hasn't been in the offing and in, in last in many years. But I just wonder if the Republicans can afford to lose the suburbs uh, and and still. Uh, uh, compete. Uh, if they lose the suburbs, does that give the, the Democrats a path to become a majority party? Well, and I um, welcome anybody who could comment on that. Yes, I'll be brief and then mm -hmm. let others go. Um, yeah, there's been this flip from uh, Republicans winning uh, white suburbs. Um, you know, it was a core part of the Reagan vote in the 80s. Um, and Democrats tending to win, uh, you know, the industrial Midwest. Um, which Trump won, and it looks like Republicans are doing pretty well with. Um, in terms of the net numbers, um, that's pretty controversial and what the size of the groups are. Yeah. Um, I think the exit polls underestimate the fraction of white non-college voters, um, yeah. and uh, consequently, um, they're, they're more of them, uh, there's certainly more in the population than there are of white college voters. Um, whether they're among the electorate is a different question. Um, but I would say, um, following up on what Mark said before about these states in the Midwest, like Indiana, Missouri, and so forth, um, those states have become safer for Republicans. Uh, Obama won Missouri and Indiana. Bill Clinton won Montana. Um, used to be Ohio was the swing state along with Florida. Um, Someone said, uh, I forget who this week, that uh, <coughs> Texas is closer than Ohio, uh, mm. is more Democratic than mm. Ohio. Uh, and that clearly is due with the growth of Democratic suburban um, vote in states like Texas and Georgia. Um, so that is a realignment. Mm. Do you have any thoughts on that, uh, Mark or Maggie? Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, there's a lot of commentary right now that says that uh, Republicans have lost the suburban vote uh, perhaps forever. Um, I think there is nothing that drove the suburban vote to Donald Trump like Hillary Clinton. And that's going to be the question in 2020 is who do the Democrats put forward? Because it's ultimately a binary choice. And so that's that's a reflection today in the midterm, again, is a lot of voters like divided government. They want to check and balance. The question is going to be when people are, are faced with the Donald Trump versus Elizabeth Warren or Donald Trump versus Kamala Harris, that's going to be a different choice for, for suburban voters. I agree with Mark, but with this caveat, which is that the what happened in 2016, and I do agree that a lot of it was uh, um, college-educated uh, women disliked Hillary Clinton, mm. um, non-college-educated uh, women disliked Hillary Clinton. Her numbers in September of 2016 um, in, in union households was extremely alarming to every Democratic mm. pollster I spoke to, and they were well below where Obama's had been in a comparable period. Um, but I think that people were willing to suspend disbelief about the things that President Trump, then candidate Trump, was saying because they thought it was an act. And I think it's really different when you have four years of amassed statements, history, um, legislative acts, executive actions, mm. 
I think it becomes uh, harder to tell yourself, and I think you will. That that's going to be the mm -hmm. big question: is do voters again say, you know, that the the good stuff outweighs what they take issue with and took issue with in 2018? Mm -hmm. Do Do you think um, the developments in Arizona and Texas and Nevada uh, represent a significant geographical shift? Uh, in the country from, from where it's been in the past. Are you, are you asking me that? Oh, yeah, you or, or anyone on the panel, actually, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the answer is yes. Yeah. Um, I, and uh, and I think that the, the, the dynamics as to why are not the same in every state. But, yeah, I mean, I think course. that yeah. you had um, uh, you had a rising rising Hispanic coalition in some of these states. I mean, Arizona in particular would mm. be one. I mean, I, if you look at, and this goes to the question in terms of 2020 versus 2016, you know, Maricopa County, which Sheriff Joe Arpaio had lost on yeah, his own, yeah. but Trump had won that county, and yeah. that county went Democrat. So yeah. I don't know, um, I, I mean, I think that the numbers, I saw David Winston, uh, who's a, a pollster who I have always enjoyed talking to, who polls for the uh, House GOP caucus, saying that it's just, yes, we won, but losing the demographics we lost are not sustainable, and those yeah. are the demographics in all the states you just mentioned. Yeah. I'd again say that uh, I, I'd be cautious about using too broad of a brush here. I think each of the states is very different. Nevada is one that has clearly been moving to the Democrat side, and the president did very poorly there mm -hmm. in 2016. Arizona, this is just anecdotal, so take it for what it's worth. But a couple times in trips to Arizona this year, I think Martha McSally was the best candidate the Republicans could have put forward. But in trips out there, there was sort of like a lack of enthusiasm. And when I talked to members of the Arizona party, they'd say, Mark, you have to understand, we have John McCain and Jeff Flake here, the two biggest opponents to the president. Our Republican Party is totally depressed. And so I think there's a lot of things happen in Arizona. In Texas, you had a, you had a tremendous candidate for the Democrats in Beto O'Rourke, also running against a candidate who I think um, probably is not the most lovable. So, <laughs> so I think in Texas there was additional dynamics at play. So um, yes, there are demographic shifts happening, but each state is very different as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah sir. I, I oh, don't Tom. disagree with that, but oh, one sorry. thing that we had was that Flake's approval among Arizona Republicans was 16%. Uh, so Arizona Republicans had abandoned Flake and McCain uh, by the time of this campaign. And what was McSally's defeat by? It doesn't take many. Yeah, I mean, the mistake is to take narrow victories and say this is a permanent pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, it easily could have gone a point or two the other direction. So I, I think you're right about that. Um, so uh, uh, we have time for t two more questions, sir. We'll come back and get you. Go ahead, please. Uh, I'm Carl Polzer from the Center on Capital Social Equity. Um, in terms of shifts of the nature of the parties, Henry Olson re had a recent column in the Washington Post that I thought was very interesting. And he noted that the, uh, a large part of the composition of the Republican Party has changed in a way that President Trump knows, but leadership on the Hill doesn't really understand yet. And that's the work, it is the working class now, not just the wealthy. And um, Trump has done something for the working class with you know, keeping down low, low, low wage worker immigration. D hasn't done much on with tariffs, mm. and certainly the Hill with the tax bill didn't do much. Mm. But is this a, a constituency that showed itself in the election? And, and I don't think the Democrats are doing a whole lot for them either. Mm. And will they have any traction in the, with, with the Republican Party? Mm. Good question. I can't speak to the constituency showing itself, Doug could, uh, more than I can. But, uh, but I will say that the number, and I, and I think health care was an effective message for Democrats, and they certainly feel it was. But the number of Democratic operatives who spent months not understanding why candidates had not just been driving, not just candidates, the leadership had not just been driving a consistent message about the tax bill and connecting it to President Trump as he gave tax cuts to his friends and doesn't care about people like you. Um, I don't know that you get that opportunity again in the next two years. I, I shared uh, with the group last night that um, uh, I, I joined the campaign because I had been Mike Pence's chief of staff. So I joined the campaign when Mike was tapped to be vice president. And I went into that as a skeptic. Is somebody who did not believe that, uh, that we would prevail in 2016. And I shared that the first time I called on to my wife and said, you know, um, there's something that I think those of us in the Beltway are missing, was a Labor Day rally in a little town in eastern Ohio where tens of thousands of people came out to support Trump and Pence, and you couldn't even move your motorcade through the crowds. And this was not, this was not 
a, a community with a large population. It was a tiny town where people had flooded out, hoping for something different, hoping that they would they'd be able to f find a candidate who could say, "We've been left behind, and you're connecting with us." And and I I don't know what's I don't know if the if Trump is going to hold on to those voters again in 2020. I think right now he has a good grasp of those voters. I think they view him as less about a policy, but about somebody who is fighting for them. And to an earlier question about whose party is this, I'm no. No doubt about the personalities, but if you look at the accomplishments the first couple of years from the Supreme Court to regulations to taxes to increase in, in defense spending, it's pretty traditional along Reagan Republican lines. The question that comes up is what's going to happen with the trade agenda this year? Because that's where the Trump agenda differentiates from a Reagan agenda. And is that something that those Midwestern working class voters say, this guy's standing up for me fighting for a better trade agenda? I think that's to be determined. I don't think there's a lot of sign that voters are concerned about trade. It appeared in a few CDs, uh, but in general, if you look at national polling on trade, it doesn't seem to be an issue that grabs people the way immigration does. Mm. But my question for Mark is, yeah, the Trump, the actual content of the Trump legislative agenda has been traditional republicanism. Uh, so you get the judicial appointments, you get a tax bill that looks like a Republican tax bill. Um, but he campaigned on some stuff that was not traditional Republican that won over these voters in 2016. Uh, he seems to be giving them the cultural, social side of that, uh, but I don't see much action on in terms of an economic agenda. Uh, and I think that hurt Republicans a lot, that the pre-existing conditions was a simple, relatively non-controversial way Democrats could say, these guys aren't actually doing anything for you. Mm -hmm. My question is about media coverage and the impact it had on the midterm elections. You know, obviously, we are in a much more fragmented media market, um, but it's fair to say that a significant segment of the media has become far more, I would just say, partisan in the coverage of Trump. And of course, we have a fragmented market with Fox News and so on. How much do you think that media coverage impacted, and is, it, did it impact less than perhaps one would expect, given how hyperventilating it has been? So, so for the Senate, there may have been an effect, but what's important to remember is that with the exception of presidential races and very high profile statewide contests like a competitive Senate race or gubernatorial contest, cable news and TV in general and these partisan outlets are not devoting that much time. So even in, you know, hotly contested House races, the majority of people who are getting information about those contests are still getting it from their local newspaper. Now, local newspapers are a dying breed, so the overall amount of content is going down, but it's still the main source. And then the second big source is from the campaigns themselves, so the ads that the candidates are running or the direct mail that they're distributing. Um, and so, you know, that's why a midterm election is systematically different and in some ways a little bit more difficult to figure out the dynamics of because there isn't this national framework. Now again, for some of these Senate races, especially within this broader umbrella of a potential blue wave, it could have had an effect. But for the overwhelming majority of candidates on the ballot, there was no national attention at all. Maggie, did you want to? I, no, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I can't really measure the effect. I, I actually think that um, we have a, a People are self-selecting about their media at this point, as you referred to. Yeah. Um, so it's, I don't think it's the media uh, in terms of coverage. Um, I, I would completely stipulate to your point that I think the tone of the coverage um, it, in a lot of places, I think, needs to uh, calm down. But I also think that there's, a, just to defend the coverage, um, I think that there is uh, the reaction with the White House um, I'm sorry, Mark. The reaction to, uh, by the White House of coverage that is 100% accurate is to say it's unfair. And so um, I, I, I have to defend the, the bulk of the coverage and say it's, it's accurate and it's just covering what's in front of us. Okay, so um, I want to thank the panel for their excellent comments. I want to thank you for your question. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, I hope you're caffeinated and sugared up uh, for our second panel. I, um, it, you won't really need caffeine and sugar because it's going to be terrific. We have, like the first panel, we have a stellar cast, and uh, we'll be uh, doing the pre-mortem now, what's going to happen over the next couple of years. Uh, and I'm just going to introduce the panel quickly as I did in the, with the, in the first uh, panel. Um, first, uh, Congressman Tom Davis in, in the middle there, who uh, is with now with Deloitte Consulting. He represented Virginia's 11th congressional district for 14 years. 
and all, I, all my explorations have said that he's the rare politician uh, who is dedicated to common sense, uh, I, without insulting anyone. Or maybe I should say he has uncommon common sense. <laughs> uh, Congressman Dina Titus, uh, sitting to the right, and she also, of course, has great common sense. Uh, she, uh, she represents the first congressional district of Nevada. She was elected to that district in 2012. Uh, she's on all sorts of important committees in the Congress, but what I noticed in, in, in investigating her was she's a fellow traveler. Um, she, uh, uh, after getting her PhD in political science from Florida State University, she taught American and Nevada politics for many years at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. So she is a true scholar practitioner, and she divides those, she bridges those two worlds for us. Uh, then we have Chris Liu down the end. Chris is my good friend and colleague at UVA, where he is the Teresa A. Su uh, Sullivan uh, Fellow. He has served in all three branches of government. He's everywhere, and he's including seven years uh, in the Obama administration. Uh, and then we have John McLaughlin, uh, right to, to the right of Juliet there, uh, and he's had an exceptionally accomplished career um, uh, 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 as, uh, uh, as a... Uh, a pollster and a consultant, and reading his client list would take up the rest of the panel, uh, so I can't do that. But one thing that jumped out at me was he was uh, he worked for former governor uh, of California Arnold Schwarzenegger. And was that the recall election? Or? Yes, both and both of them. <laughs> both elections. Yeah. And I also worked for Tom Davis. Uh, oh, okay. I missed that in my investigation. Yeah. I'll do the introduction. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm really getting well, a sense of power in here today. Yeah, I mean, yeah, right. Must be being in Washington, you know, to be out of, out, out of uh, Charlottesville. And then, we, last, of course, but not least, is uh, Juliet Alperin. Uh, uh, Juliet uh, is uh, the Washington Post senior national affairs correspondent, and she's the author of an excellent book on Congress, Fight Club Politics. Uh, she also wrote a book about sharks. I don't know if that was about politics. That's my feel-good no book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, I'm a huge fan uh, of Juliet. Yeah. I've known her for a long time. And, and I'm really delighted you're here to, to uh, or moderate this panel. So I'll turn Thanks. things over to Juliet. I don't know if she'll call me up in the middle or not, but I'm ready to go if I have to. <laughs> so enjoy it. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, OK, so we're going to, well, technically, we're going to start out with um, five minutes of comments from our speaker. They can even make that one minute or you can opt to pass um, and then we will, and then I will kick it off with some questions. But obviously what we're looking forward to is what's gonna happen in the next couple of years. What are the implications of the midterms for what can or cannot be accomplished in Washington as we head into the next cycle? So John, we'll kick it off with you if you have opening thoughts. Okay. Um, let me see, there's a lot of policy people here, so. For those of you who care about substance, I'm in charge of substance abuse. I do campaigns. So anyway, uh, with that, let me ask questions. Since I'm a pollster, I get to ask questions first. How many people here could tell me what Donald Trump's 2016 message was? What was his slogan? What was the Republican message to reelect their majority in 2018? Precisely. You've gotten it right. Uh, just to, to, to predict what's going to happen in the next two years, I want to make a couple of points. First, on the post-election result, where we've now seen the Democrats take a net, as of today, as of we sat in this panel, a net of 35 seats and the Republicans gain one. The Republicans should have held the House, and at times, I already announced my conflict, when Tom Davis was running the NRCC, we would hold the House. We should have held the House this year. And in fact, on October 25th, my brother Jim and I wrote an article saying that we were two points behind. But if the undecided split against us two to one the way they were going to, because we had no message, um, we'll lose 31 seats. Well, we're off by like four so far, but, um, but it's fair, been fairly accurate. And the, and the reason they did was because when we asked in our post-election survey, and this is all posted on our website, McLaughlinOnline.com, um, when we asked in the post-election survey of 1,000 voters across the country, uh, did the Republicans have a compelling message to reelect their majority? Only 41% of all voters said yes. Only 32% uh, of the independents and only 16% of the Democrats said yes. So unlike the president who was elected, who I was happy to work for in 2016, who when I told him, I said, you know, your message before, I once gave him a Reagan button and said, let's make America great again. And he looked at it and he says, no, nah, that's different. It says, let's. <laughs> 
and he throws it in his desk. <laughs> I'm like, see, he used to say, make America great again. But he understood message uh, when, he, when he was running in that election. And the second thing, besides having no message, we lost the turnout game. The Republicans were talking about all this great grassroots, all this great ground game that they had. We got crushed. I mean, in 2010, the Republicans, out of 91 million voters who showed up, the Republicans equaled Democrats in party affiliation. In 2012, we got crushed, where the Democrats had a six-point edge at 130 million showed up. 2014, we had a one-point edge, but only 83 million people voted. 2016, we held close. Trump was three points behind the Democrats, and or the party affiliation was 139 million people. And that was his strategy, was to bring out record numbers of voters where we could win. We, 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 we decided early on over the summer we had to bring out new voters. Well, unlike previous midterms, as, as and the previous panel said, you had 114 million people vote in this election. It's a record for a midterm, just like the last presidential was a record. But the Democrats had a four-point edge. It was just like a presidential year. So what you had was you had more Democrats. In fact, in our post-election, we track uh, ideology, the question. This is the first time that moderates outnumbered conservatives since 2000 in our survey. And the turnout was, was more like an Obama coalition, younger, more diverse, et cetera. And of the people in the, in the published polls for the CNN, uh, the 16% said it was their first time voting in a midterm. They voted Democrats 62 to 36. So the new voters in this, unlike the Trump election two years before, the new voters voted for the Democrats. So relevant to what's going to happen in the next couple of years, the president needs to broaden his, his, uh, his job approval. I spoke to him right before Christmas in 20, uh, 2016 when he called me and said, well, that was a great race, huge win. I said, well, you know, we didn't make it by a landslide. But he said to me, <laughs> he said, no, it was a huge win. I said, no, it was 78,000 votes <laughs> out of 139 million, three states. Um, but, but I said, pretty your helmet on, because at the time he called me, he was a, on his, pre as president-elect, we had a national survey, we had a 48% job approval, only 41 disapprove. I said, get your helmet on. The Democrats are not letting you go over 50% in your job approval, because with the Republican House and a Republican Senate, you'll get things done. The president now has lost the House, or he's not lost it. He actually, I think he, he held them, as Mark said, held them from being as close as they could. But... Um, because he lifted them up with a lot of his voters, the 63 million Trump voters. But, um, but anyway, he's, he needs to definitely broaden his job approval because we had his job approval in the survey uh, where he had 48% approved, 49 disapproved in the post-election, and, and the media surveys were worse. Um, the battle for the Senate's going to be renewed. The 34 seats that are up, 20 are Republicans, 14 are Democrats. Only three of them for states that their different party won the presidency. So Alabama, you got Jones will be the top target for the Republicans, and you got Cory Gardner in Colorado and Collins in Maine will be top targets for the Democrats. The rest, Trump won the Republican states or uh, Clinton won the Democrat states. The Republicans need a suburban strategy. Tom Davis will tell you about that. They need to attract moderates without imploding their base. Trump's base is solid. I mean, Trump's base is, is really solid in, in terms of the number not just approved but strongly approved of him. But he also needs to broaden. He's got to go above that 50%. The race in 2020 will be an Obama coalition versus a Trump coalition, which is the scary news for Republicans. Because the Republicans, we got 63 million votes when Trump ran. The Democrats in the first Obama race in 2008 got 70 million. So the raw numbers that, just like this election was a turnout battle where the Democrats beat us, we have to broaden our base plus get much of our base back out again. Um, and the GOP needs to regain their change message. We were tracking in our surveys, do you want to change Obama's policies or do you want to continue Obama's policies? And in September of 2015, when I started asking it, they, the majority of the voters in the country wanted to change 57-35. This post-election survey we just got, they said continue Obama policies 47 to 44. Now, a big part of that was the fact that this was an Ob more, the Obama voters turned out more than I would say the Trump voters did. And as a signal to that, we released in the same poll, we asked people in which primary you're going to vote for, if you're an independent, 
and Republicans, Republicans, Democrats, Democrats. In that same survey, if they said they were going to vote in a primary, in the Republican side, Trump got 79%. Mitt Romney, 5%. That was our standard bear back in 2012. And uh, John Kasich, 4%. And uh, Jeff Flake, 1%. But there's a margin of error, plus or minus three. It could be minus two. <laughs> but the bottom line is the Republican Party is now the party of Trump. And he won because he was the most anti-Obama candidate. During the, early on in the primaries, I was telling him, you have to wake up every morning and attack Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. He said, no problem. <laughs> and he won out of the field of 17 because he was the most anti-Obama candidate. And he hadn't candidate. stopped either. No. <laughs> By the way, you should have seen him when I said to him, it's not about you. And the whole conversation went south. But on the Democrat side, one last thought on the Democrat side, like our field was, was scrambled back then. Uh, Joe Biden has 19%. Michelle Obama had 17%. Bernie Sanders, 16%. Hillary Clinton, 8%. It's not the party of Clinton anymore. The two front runners are Ob Obama's vice president and his wife. That's still their party. And our party's now the party of Trump. We are headed for a big battle in 2020 between those two coalitions. And who can hold it together and expand it is going to win the election. So with that, Excellent. I Tom, take it away. Well, let me just first talk about the midterm and put it in perspective. <clears throat> um, the president's party usually loses House seats in a midterm for three reasons. One is uh, presidents, when they win, they bring in people on their coattails when their, their voters don't come out in the midterm. Those members have to stand on their own and can't survive. Uh, we call these Trump-centric voters. You had Obama-centric voters. And turning them out, Chris, remember, in the midterms was very difficult. Um, the president tried to do that. And I think in these Senate races, he helped boost them up by his appointments. But in, by emphasizing the issues, he did probably threw some of his suburban members under the bus by not emphasizing the economy and really going after uh, immigration. Um, second reason is the out party is generally more enthusiastic. Uh, after Kavanaugh and the caravan, that, that evened up a bit. Uh, Democrats, I think, had a still an edge. If you look at this turnout, it was the highest uh, off-year turnout since 1914. I think everybody got their votes out. As you noted, they're, under these two coalitions, Democrats just have more voters uh, than Republicans. Um, and, but finally, and this was the telling point, independents generally use midterm elections to put a check on the president rather than giving him a blank check. They want to balance government. Uh, this is not, they might have voted for Trump last time, but they wanted to put some guardrails on him. And in these suburban districts in particular, I think that led to a, basically a, a killing zone for a lot of these suburban Republican uh, members of the House. Um, the last uh, three elections prior to this where the party controlled uh, the House, the Senate, and the presidency, they lost the House. That was 1994, 2006, 2010. So this shouldn't have surprised anybody from a histor historical perspective. Sure, the economy was at 3.7 percent, but you have uh, a leader in the White House that doesn't understand, I think, sometimes that politics is a game of addition. It's not a game of uh, just holding your own base, as you noted. The Republicans, if they don't look at a additional base, their base is shrinking, Democratic base is growing, and that's a long-term problem. The good news for Republicans is that coalitions are not static. Coalitions are constantly changing, and as you try to get to 50%, uh, you have within those coalitions uh, elements that are not comfortable with each other. And it's, you're, you're, when you're a governing party, you have an opportunity to pick some of those off if you're smart enough uh, to do it. Now, let's talk about what's happened in American politics over the last 20 to 25 years. The last time we really had a productive uh, uh, Congress, Nina, was your first term, 2009, 2010. A lot of change very rapidly. There was obviously, when you have the rapidity of change, you get a reaction to that. People who feel their status threatened or uncertain. Republicans were able to come back in 2010 uh, and, and take, um, take the Senate. And that didn't stop President Obama from governing, though. He said, well, I may not be able to get legislation through, but I still have executive orders. I still have regulations. And by filling the courts and stretching the envelope of what you could do from the executive branch, uh, he was able to continue his... Uh, his governance uh, might have been in smaller increments, but he's able to do DACA. Uh, you take a number of the of the uh, of his achievements; uh, they were basically not done with legislative help. Uh, even the uh, Iranian uh, agreement uh, was not done with legislative support. Congress didn't support that, but they worked that through the executive side. Of course, what you do by the pen, you can take away with the eraser. And uh, Trump is coming back. But but the new model, just so everybody understands, is executive order, regulation. Uh, and then having a favorable court system that will uphold these as you stretch the envelope. 
That's why the loss of the House, it's not pretty for Trump because he's going to have investigations galore. Uh, the, over the last 25 years, and I was chairman of the chief investigative committee in the House, uh, Henry Waxman, my ranking member, we actually worked pretty well together. But it was uh, is basically you over-investigate the other side, you under-investigate uh, your side. Um, and I think we're going to see, you know, how this, uh, handle, how this is handled this time. But clearly the Republicans under-investigated Trump. And I think there's a lot of pent-up demand within the Democratic conference and among their voters to go after and ask some hard questions about some of the things that have been going on. So we can look forward uh, uh, to that as well. Voters have also been behaving in a parliamentary model. It's a, de it's a balance of power system, but we are operating as if it's parliamentary. What do I mean by that? Voters are no longer voting for the person. They're voting for the party. We have more straight ticket voting at this time than any time in the last hundred years. Uh, many of these, if you looked at the interviews on election, if you saw, I don't know, who, I, but I, it's a change. I'm sending a message to Trump, uh, vice versa. Um, and so the, the members are elected based on their party. And so your natural affinity is to protect your quarterback, the head of the party, or to go after and, and sack the quarterback of the opposing uh, party. And that's basically what it's come down to. But what does it mean parliamentary? It means when members come to Washington, uh, they no longer recognize this as Congress as an independent branch. It means that the president's party in Congress is an appendage of the executive branch, where they are protecting their quarterback and under investigating. Uh, the opposition party is, is they're no longer the minority party, uh, where they are a minority shareholder in government, where they're offering perfecting amendments, where they're mitigating the effects of bad legislation. In point of uh, fact, what, the, uh, what they are is they're the opposition party, and they're no to everything. And if you don't believe me, just take a look at the Senate confirmation process today, which is has been getting broken. I don't know which party started it, but it keeps getting worse and worse and worse, where even non-controversial nominees uh, are taking 30 hours you know, just, just to get through the process. And you have over 100 uh, nominees. Some of them have been sitting there for over a year, stopped up. Republicans giving priorities to the regulatory agencies and the courts because that's how you govern now. And Congress just becomes, as I said before, it's just like a broken branch. And then on the political coalitions, I want to make one more point. Um, they are pretty defined ge uh, geographically as well. Dina, you would know this from, from Las Vegas, going back to the Cal counties and how that's evolved over the last 25 years. So I we generally say if you live in a county uh, with a Whole Foods, uh, you probably vote so it has a Democratic congressman uh, <laughs> voted for Hillary Clinton. And if you live in a county with a Cracker Barrel, you probably voted for Trump. Now, I gave this speech in Arlington, and this lady said, I don't want to correct you, Mr. Davis, but don't you mean crate and barrel. And I... <laughs> And I just said, uh, I just said, I rest my case. So I'll stop it here and turn it over to Dina. Well, I do live where a Whole Foods exists. And, uh, I hate to appear gloating, but yahoo, I have to say. I just came from a caucus meeting with all our new members, and it was pretty exciting to be back in the majority. Uh, just to respond to some of the things that have been said about the last election, what happened is that Democrats actually acted like Republicans in the election. We are always the ones who are accused of having no message. If you talk about the Republican message, they can do it in six words, lower taxes, less government, stronger defense. Meantime, Democrats are wandering on and on trying to intellectualize and explain things. But this time, we had the message. And ironically, the message was health care. That's what cost us the election in 2010, and it's what won the election this time. In every race across the country, they were focusing on people with pre-existing conditions. And once you give somebody something, it's very hard to take it away. Also, we, uh, we experienced what it's like to have an unpopular leader. You know, how many ads were run with a picture of Nancy Pelosi's face on it in previous elections? This time it didn't work. Now, part of that is because it's been around a long time. It's old. It, and she's been in the minority. But what happened is the unpopular leader on the Republican side was more unpopular than the unpopular leader on the Democratic side. So the anti-Trump message played better than the anti-Pelosi message in the races. Also, Democrats often lack discipline. This time, our candidates were extremely disciplined. They stuck to the message. They played to their local districts. Look at Connor Lamb, for example, in Pennsylvania. And so it was the Republicans who were not as disciplined. <coughs> They, uh, there was fighting within the ranks of who was going to get the money, and that often uh, differed depending on if you were the big donors or you were the, the internal PACs. They didn't know whether to talk about uh, 
the economy or immigration. Uh, they, they were not the disciplined ones. And we had higher turnout. Usually Democrats turn out much less. They're not our inveterate voters in the off year. And this time they were, and they were enthusiastic. And that went back to the women's march that occurred right after the inauguration where more people turned out than actually turned out to the inauguration despite the pictures that you might have seen. <coughs> Going forward now, I think a couple of things. Uh, the fact, there are going to be some 60 new members. Uh, 35 seats have flipped. The Republicans have about 20 new members. Uh, these are different kinds of candidates than we may have seen in the past. And any time you're trying to deal with a large caucus and a diverse caucus, it's going to cause internal challenges. These are people who, in many cases, raise money on their own. It was through the Internet and through small donations, not depending so much on PACs. Some forswore PACs, but... Uh, so they raised money on their own. They were activists before they became candidates. They were working on other people's campaigns or other issues, whether it was uh, gun violence or um, Mothers Against Drunk Driving or Black Lives Matter. So they were activists. They're, they know how to do that sort of thing, but they're not really experienced in governing. Many of them, this is the first time they've el ever held public office. Uh, and they weren't dependent on the party. A lot of these folks believe they got here on their own, so the old loyalties that used to exist aren't there anymore, and that means there'll be less ability to impose discipline. <coughs> You're already seeing that in some of the kind of internal leadership battles. So now what's our challenge? For the Democrats, we have to choose between investigate and legislate. And that, uh, that's going to be difficult because, as you heard Mr. Davis say, the Republican Congress has not investigated this, this administration. We don't believe they've held it accountable. But if we investigate everything that's a potential out there, it'll just look like we're not doing our job. We've got to legislate because we've got to look forward to 2020. And that's, we've got to prove that we know how to do this and we can get something done. However, if you don't investigate some, you're going to lose your base because they're the ones who sent us here and they're the ones who want to see something happen and some people kind of call to the carpet. If we're going to legislate, the challenge is what kind of legislation are we going to pass? Are we going to appeal to that progressive base that sent us here in many cases? Or are we going to try to come with something that we might be able to get done? Is it going to be gun violence or infrastructure? Is it going to be cleaning up the swamp, or are we going to come with maybe what the president's now talking about, criminal justice reform? That's going to be a challenge, and Democrats will now begin to wonder, as Republicans did, because you've seen a little bit of this occur, is if you don't appeal to that base, if you don't feed the beast, then you will be challenged next time around from the left. And is that what will be created within our party as it was in the uh, Republican Party over the last decade? Finally, everybody in the Democratic Party is running for president, so that is, that is also going to cause some challenges for us moving forward in the Congress. <laughs> So as I, it, far be it for me to opine on what the Congress is going to do with the Congresswoman here, but I think what is interesting is when you look at the last three times a president has lost the House, they've used words like chastened, a shellacking, a thumping, and they've tried to govern with that in the back of their head. That's certainly not the tone this president has done. So when you look, for instance, you go back to 1994, President Clinton loses the House, um, he pivots, he does welfare reform, he does Defense of Marriage Act. Um, you even look at 2006 when President George W. Bush lost the House. Obviously, a lot of that was based in Iraq, but he still managed to get an energy bill passed, a transportation bill. He got the Patriot Act reauthorized. Um, in 2010, President Obama loses the House. Um, he, he goes to Speaker Boehner. They try to do this grand bargain um, on taxes. And, uh, and so what, what you've seen from the President, and I think the other panelists have said it, is a President who has a very firm base and has not, notwithstanding his reputation as a New York deal maker, um, doesn't seem to show the inclination to want to deal. And so while it is fashionable to say we can cut a deal on immigration, on infrastructure, whatever, uh, there's no sense that from the president's perspective there's any incentive to do that. And I would argue from the Democratic perspective there's frankly no interest in doing that either. 
Um, you would, you know, in an election, in a very winnable presidential election in 2020, the last thing you want to do is start giving him uh, some policy wins. Yes, you should move to pass campaign finance reform, ethics reform. You should push a minimum wage. These are great message items, uh, as the congresswoman said, that appeal to your base. Um, but on an issue, for instance, like paid family leave, where there is genuinely a basis for bipartisan support, would a Democratic Congress give the president a win that potentially lets him expand his base? I would argue politically you should not do that. So I think what we're likely going to see is um, investigations. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say there will not be impeachment. Um, I will think you will see a series of message bills that will come out of the House uh, that will stall in the Senate. Uh, it sets the Democrats up both for re-election in 2020. Um, it also provides the um, the underpinning for all these presidential candidates uh, of what they should focus on. Okay, so I'm going to ask a question about policy. We'll see if I can squeeze in a question about governing, and then we'll and then we'll open it up. So on policy, all right, Chris has now just kind of thrown cold water on the prospects for any meaningful policy work in the next two years. Uh, I'm curious of whether other members of the panel have a different view. When you look at, you know, obviously there is the things that come up. I mean, criminal justice reform is probably the lightest lift. When you look at infrastructure, when you look at trade, uh, you know, and and prescription drugs are are there you know are there any realistic productive compromises? Well, I mean, on, on trade, you're under fast track where they have to have an up or down vote. They got no choice on that. So I think you'll see a trade vote on Canada and Mexico. Uh, I don't think you'll see. And how vote. do you think it'll do? I think it'll be fine. I mean, I think it's a better agreement than it was before. At the end of the day, what do you go back to? You throw markets in turmoil if you don't to confirm. That that's that's my opinion. I haven't haven't read it. I just and I don't know. Who's read it? But uh, that, but that's my gut. You know, from from what I have read um, about it, I I think yeah. If if I'm Democratic leadership, uh, you want to hold your lead. You want to kick this down the road. You want to pass your legislation, as Chris noted. You want to pass minimum wage, do guns, get your base ready, uh, so you can say, look, we've done our job. Go back. But the Senate's blocking it and then try to take the Senate back in the presidency. That, that's the political play on this. Now, look, a lot of members come to Washington all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and, and they want to legislate. So I think they'll take a shot at an infrastructure bill, would be my guess, and see if you can put that together. But I'm going to bring out the elephant in the room. And that is, right now, if you look at the exit polls, 41% of Americans want President uh, uh, Trump impeached. Three-quarters of the Democratic base thinks he should have been impeached yesterday. You drop the Mueller report on top of that, and I don't know what it's going to say, depending what's in it, but you've got to react to that. And I'm, I don't know that anybody can say with any certainty, having not seen the report, what happens. But the pressure, you know, from all the sounding boards, from, the, from MSNBC, from your commentators, uh, from the Internet, and, and members looking over their shoulder at the primaries, puts tremendous pressure on how the leadership handles that. Obviously, they're not eager to get into a fight where you're looking at a two-thirds majority in the Senate that you're not likely to get. Uh, on the other hand, it's, it's, a, it's very difficult to manage. Look, we had the Tea Party that I think helped take us down. Uh, Dina, you got a herbal tea party now over there that's doing, <laughs> that, that, that offers the same potential as they, as they look at it. And I'll just say this, I'll say this gratuitously. I think Pelosi was a really good speaker. If you take a look at what she got through and everything else, and the Democrats that are fighting this, I, I, yeah, I guess that you do what you got to do in this business. Um, but I don't know where else you go if it's not her at this point. She has a, you know, she has a record of accomplishment. She's been through this before, uh, both with a Republican president and a Democratic president. Give her another term and move on would be my advice. Uh, I don't, my endorsement doesn't help her at all. I'm sure in the conference, but, but uh, that's my. Well, then let's talk a little bit. No, I didn't mean. I'll, no, 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 that's have somebody else say something. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. Well, I, I will say on. this. I, you know, look, I, I, I'm a skeptic, um, but on, on some of these key issues we have talked about, infrastructure, guns, in particular immigration, there is a deal to be cut. The four of us, the five of us up here could sit in a room and come up with an immigration deal right now. There, there is some combination of border money for DACA that if you come up with the right combination, you can. It, we could all agree on that. Now, whether the politics outside the room, when this starts getting spun by both sides, allows it to happen, is a whole other issue. And again, even on something like infrastructure that we think is um, an easy issue, how much of that's publicly funded? How much is public-private? What are we funding? Uh, you know, the, the the details become very complicated in all this. That's that's my skepticism. Yeah. Okay. And I, so, I uh, in terms of governing, obviously we we 
talked a lot about Trump. He looms large. But when you look at the Senate and the House, you know, in the Senate, you now have a more conservative Republican caucus, right, that, that, that including new members who are both to the right of their predecessors and personally loyal to the president, given what happened with the election. On the Democratic side, again, you obviously have this inter-party fight right now going on over speakership. And also, interestingly, while, you know, depending on what happens with this leadership race, Pelosi's a, a veteran in, in running the House, Danny Hoyer's a veteran, but you only have three of the incoming committee chairs have, have done that before. So, and Congresswoman Titus, if you could lead us off, you know, what's your sense of the governing dynamic in the House, and how does that play against now you have an upper chamber that is more, not less conservative? Well, certainly all our meetings so far have been about how we need to govern and how we need to show that we can do this and how we can't get off on all these tangents and all these investigations. Now, that sounds great, but when it comes to doing it, it's much more difficult. I would also say that the House Republicans are more conservative than they were, too, because it's the members in the swing districts who swing out. And it's unfortunate for governing that those are always the ones targeted, whether they're held by Democrats or by Republicans. Those are the ones you go after because those are the ones you have the best chance of winning. So we've lost some people who could have been more moderate and perhaps engaged in some of this compromise. Now they're more hardcore. You saw uh, it, they had a battle, too, for leadership, it, it turned out. But the, the probably most conservative member there got 40, 45 votes uh, for their House leadership on their side. And so I think that, that complicates it. You know, it's, it's not just Democrats versus Republicans. It's House versus Senate. I always heard the Republicans were the opposition. The Senate was the enemy. I, I don't know if that's yeah. still true or not. But, mm -hmm. uh, and then, you, then it's us versus versus the, as an institution, Congress versus the, the White House. Now, the Senate has just been complicit in everything that the White House has done. I was shocked the other day when the president says, well, if the Democrats in the House investigate us, my Senate will just investigate them back. Now, in the past, the Senate would have never stood for that. They would have been the strong independent check on the, on the White House. Uh, so even though they have been in bed, so to speak, with the president, sometimes he turns them around. He will say one minute he supports something, and they'll kind of go down that road, and then he'll change his mind, and he leaves them hanging as well. So with all of these dynamics, I'm not real optimistic about anything happening. I think the best that the House can do is be a backstop to stopping some of the bad things going through, and the Senate will probably be forced into a position of just doing as many judge approvals as they can, and that will be kind of their agenda. Nina, can I just second a point you made? I mean, just to give you an example, remember President Trump going after Republicans who wouldn't vote for the Ob Obamacare replacement? And then afterwards said it was a cruel bill. So you kind of threw them under the bus. So you, you, you get mixed messages sometimes. I, I will also add on this governing point and to pick up on a piece that um, Tom made. Um, in the Democratic side, you're not as concerned about new committee chairman, in part because we don't have term limits. So these people have served in these positions for and ranking members for a very long time. They essentially are like the shadow uh, uh, of opposition. And so, you know, whether it's Elijah Cummings, Frank Pallone, these folks have been there forever. Their staffs have been there forever. Adam Schiff uh, functionally has been acting as a alternate intelligence committee chair. So for him to actually take the chair won't be that different at this point. Excellent. All right. We're going to open up for questions. I'd like to say that Nancy Pelosi has been endorsed here at the Hoover Institution by two Republicans today, which I really don't know what that means for her bid, but we'll see if that, uh... anyway, sorry. Um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are in terms of one of the most basic functions of Congress, if you're looking back to getting into governing and appropriations, which has been an enormous mess for quite a while. Um, and we have the last two years of the caps co coming up. Just wondering what your thoughts are in terms of what can happen in the next two years. And Congressman Davis, I'm also interested in your thoughts. Um, uh, the Main Street Alliance and the Tuesday group has been a core of reasonable people that we've been able to reach out to and work together with um, with the recent elections and the loss of a lot of really good folks. What do you see as the future of kind of moderate groups like that to work within um, this kind of Congress and this kind of environment? And then I'm also super interested. It is so bitterly divided now, whether you're talking about Congress or the country, is there any way we can get back to a reasonable place, whether it's 
Congress or just this country, we seem to be just so horribly divided. So um, you raise a, a couple of issues that I'll try to address and then turn it over. On the approach process, uh, the difficulty you're going to have is you're going to, getting that 302 agreement uh, between the House and Senate, they have very different priorities. Senate Republicans, House Democrats have very different uh, uh, priorities. Um, Senate may pass a budget. You can pass that with 50 votes. They may not. These are sometimes inconvenient documents. But reaching that, re reaching that agreement, well, if you remember under the Democrats, they were, there were several years in a row they didn't do it. It didn't really matter. I mean, in the scheme of things, it didn't have any practical effect. Um, so I think that when we have divided government, you're more likely to get CRs, uh, and you're more likely, uh, uh, which are continuing resolutions, and you're more likely to get shutdowns just because it's so hard to agree on the, on the numbers. This was an exceptional year where we got most of the appropriation bills. But you really want to get appropriations done? Bring back earmarks. You get, give re members a reason to vote yes instead of making the default vote a no vote against the other side. And if Democrats are serious about this, they'll bring it back, and you'll find some Republicans joining them uh, who want to bring back something. In fact, I will argue this, that it was the Republicans doing away with earmarks, letting President Obama earmark where the money went, complaining all the while that he was intruding on the legislative uh, agenda. But it meant their members couldn't personalize their districts, and it made the system much more parliamentary. It's, it's hard to personalize a district. I wasn't Tom Davis in Northern Virginia. I was Mr. Woodrow Wilson Bridge. I was Mr. Ray Alden Dollar. I mean, seriously, those things can make a difference, and they take that away, and you take your biggest tool away, and you lose the house. Look in the mirror, guys. You, took, you structured the rules. You didn't understand the political process. In terms of getting back to normal, let me just say, we're getting disruption all over the world. This is not unique to the United States. In many ways, Donald Trump is a manifestation of a larger problem. If you think he's the liberals, he's the cause of He's a manifestation of a larger problem of major disruption with the rapidity of change throughout the globe and the inability of political parties to make the adjustments in their coalitions to address it. So we're seeing this come up in different ways. And America has uniquely three other things that, that further this polarization. One is the advent of single-party districts. Most of these members, even in a year like this, the only race that counts is their primary race. Dina, you've served in both kinds of districts. You've served in competitive districts, and now you've got a pretty safe seat. And it changes the dynamics a lot in terms of your, at least the political calculus as you go into this. But when 80% of the members, the only race that counts is their primary, they're looking over their right or left shoulder. If you compromise, that's, that, you don't get rewarded for that. You get good behavior gets punished. Bad behavior gets rewarded, and I always said, when you get up and yell, you lie at the State of the Union, you raise a million dollars online. There, there's no reason. I mean, you don't get bad behavior doesn't uh, get, and you have it on both sides. I didn't mean to, to single out one person, but that, that's a prime example. Secondly is, uh, and aside from the single-party districts, which, by the way, the major cause is not gerrymandering. It's just residential sorting patterns. And also the voting rights implementation has made an issue with that because when you pack minorities, you're bleaching the districts around it. Uh, and so, but that's just one cause. The second is the fact that um, most people now receive their news. When you did away with the fairness doctrine, you started to get uh, talk radio sprang up. Uh, now you've got cable TV, and if you watch MSNBC and Fox on the same night, you know, everybody's in their own little bubble. And finally, this is how most people get their news. And the crap to content ratio coming over the internet is just exceptionally this, – this isn't news, folks. These are entertainment models, and that's how people get their information. And then finally, let's, let's have an honest discussion about what campaign finance reform did. It moved the money from the parties, which have been a centering force in American politics for, two, for 200 years, out to the wings. And you can blame it, whatever you want, but I will just say there's more special interest money in there today than there ever were, was before McCain-Feingold. It's the law of unintended consequences. So look at it this way. The districts have gone from basically centered competitive districts out to here. The way people receive their news has gone from central vetted factual news out to everybody's in their own bubble. And then the money has gone from, this, from the candidates and the parties out to these super active groups. What do you expect? And until you address that, I think you're going to see a polarization. It makes it very difficult. Okay, I'd like John to, to speak to this issue of moderate, like, where is there, is there a future for moderate? Since obviously those are many of your clients. Some of them got hammered this last uh, election. What, what's the future on that front? I, actually, I agree with this because I worked for him. So, I, 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 no, but, but no, it's, the, the tough part is like when you talk about those Senate races, if you got 20 Republican senators up and, and 18 are from states that Trump won, the primary voters love Donald Trump. Now, what's interesting is Trump won because he was the most anti-Obama candidate in the field of 17. 
The Democrat side is the congresswoman has, has a list. They're all running. And the anti-Trump candidate will be their nominee. So it's going to be very hard to, to control this and to get things done. Um, again, while, while you, those of you who deal with substance are asking substantive questions, those of us who deal with substance abuse... You know, we're going to, we're stirring this up, but, but the voters, the voters are voting this way. And as Congressman said, it's getting more partisan and more ideological. Okay. We have a, a questioner in the back, all the way in the back, please. Hello, uh, Carl Polzer again. I wonder whether the Kavanaugh hearing isn't a cautionary tale to Democrats on overzealous investigation. So we've heard a lot about how Trump and, you know, maybe Grassley handled that well, and I think they handled it competently. But I, to me... The Democrat leaders in the Senate were what created the opening. From, from, the, from an insider's perspective, to look at the timeline that Grassley put out, where the um, Democrats sat on information for two months, that if they really wanted to get a good candidate, they would have given to the majority. From, the, from Joe Blow's perspective, here's a guy who's, what he did in high school might take away his work. That could affect you in HR if you're a, a worker. Um, and from somebody raising a high school kid, they. You know what high school kids are like. I just painted my daughter's room. She ain't going to the Supreme Court. There was a lot of graffiti on there put in during parties. But now maybe she can because it's been covered up. <laughs> but but um, I'm just wondering, this kind of identity politics, is it like the Me Too movement going one bridge too far in terms of resonating with the male minority and uh, Trump voters? Is that something Democrats have to worry about? The one thing, the one thing I think you got right is that the Kavanaugh hearings backfired in that we saw it in the polls in that, in that, uh, uh, cause I, I, I never thought it was about the Supreme court. I thought Ch Senator Schumer, who is a really good strategist, looked at the 35 Senate seats that were up and said, 26 of my Democrats. And, and they were, and he's thinking, how do I get a majority? And if the Republicans had pulled judge Kavanaugh or if, uh, Trump had backed off or they didn't get the votes, and they barely got the votes, millions of Trump voters would have stayed home. Because 7 out of 10 Trump voters said the Supreme Court and federal courts were a very important reason as to their vote for President Trump. So I think he was gambling to try to suppress our vote. You know, and Republicans are usually not the smartest, so <laughs> you'll probably agree with me on that. But they, but, but a lot of times... No, no, no. We make we I make with you. I mean, uh, no, we can <laughs> exactly. we can make strategic errors, but it, but on this one they did the right thing. They stood by it, and it and after that we had a survey in Missouri that for a super PAC that the Republican had gone ahead, and the Republicans were gaining a lot of those Senate seats, so it kind of backfired him. But it was a gamble where he was looking at bad terrain, and he was trying to figure out how to take it back. And uh, but in the future, I tell you the one thing that was really bad about it is. When we ask about the press in our post-election survey, 48% of all voters said it was biased against President Trump. Only 9% said four. There's a general bias in there. Plus, we'd asked earlier in the year a question about, do you believe everything in the media? And only 77% said yes. So there's a lot of, unlike Juliet, who might call me at times to say, did you say this? I'll read quotes by myself where I'll call the reporter and he said, well, somebody said you said this. And, and it's like, so there's a lot of stuff and as, as Congressman Davis says, there's a lot of stuff where people are reading what they want to believe and not reading facts. And uh, I thought what was thrown at Judge Kavanaugh backfired in that a lot of it still isn't substantiated. And if it was substantiated, he wouldn't be there today on the courts. So I think that was the real damage that was done. The congresswomen are looking at each other. Who's going to take this one? Let, 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 me, let me throw out just two thoughts on this. Um, uh, as we discussed in the previous panel, I think we certainly need more data as to what the Kavanaugh effect was. Prior to Election Day, there were as many polls that showed the Kavanaugh effect backfired on Republicans. And one of the issues that I look at, the, the CNN post-election uh, survey, the exit poll, found independents supported Democrats plus 12 which is a reversal of 2014. So you always look at where the independents shift. Now, they could have just easily shifted for 101 other reasons. But I think that the crux of your question, I think where I disagree with you, is the idea that this was sort of a craven political move by Chuck Schumer instead of a reasoned, um, uh, a, 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 an attempt to, to, to uh, hear people um, whose voices had not been heard during this process, um, and that it was genuinely based out of conviction. Now, obviously, politics 
is part of all of this. And, and so on both sides, you can't, everyone's hands we can stipulate are unclean in this process. Um, but as much of this was giving voice to people um, who had not had a voice for a very long time. Okay. Also, I believe in the previous panel, you heard a lot about the gender gap and how very large it was this time uh, for Democrats. And it always breaks for Democrats, but this time larger than ever. And I think that has something to do with the Kavanaugh hearings, too. Uh, Supreme Court judges always matter to Democrats, but we are never as effective at using it as Republicans are. And usually that boils down to a conservative judge who will vote on the abortion issue the way they care about. And I just say this, Kavanaugh helped the Republicans in the Senate races, it hurt him in the House races. To go back to the appropriations question. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, please yes, chime in. Yes, and, for earmarks. I'm, I'm all for earmarks. I totally agree with that. Uh, another thing, though, that has hurt the appropriations process is that instead of being just about money, it has become about policy. And so often they try to stick poison pills into appropriations bills that kill an otherwise maybe manageable compromise because we're just not going to vote for something that has an abortion provision in it, even though that has very little to do with whatever it is we're appropriating about. So but just just to follow up on that, I just have one question, which is, but aren't the aren't appropriation riders going to be one of the best ways that the new House majority can effectively influence what the government is actually doing? Well, I was going to say the irony of this is that over the last several years, most of those riders have had to get taken out because the House can't pass an appropriations bill with the Freedom Caucus. So the, the House, it's actually given a, a surprising amount of power to the Democrats to have relatively clean appropriations bills. Um, I, I worked in uh, Senate leadership uh, in the last time the Republicans lost control of the House. And I think Congressman Davis, who were the chairman of the NRCC at the time, if I recall, um, and I remember I was in the room with Senator McConnell when he found out he wasn't going to be the uh, leader of the Senate, and he always looks unhappy. He looked very unhappy. And my question is about the Republican side of the equation. You know, I can see a very complicated dynamic that Senator McConnell is going to have to face in dealing with Republicans in the House. Congressman Titus, you rightly pointed out there's a lot of tension between the House and the Senate independently of party affiliation, but this may be an extremely dramatic problem. Because if the House Republicans decide to take a fully oppositionist standpoint to the Democrats in what they do in the House, uh, Senator McConnell is going to be, if the goal is to get some achievements for Trump for the 2020 re-election, he will have to play with Democrats in a way that may cause some serious discontent among House Republicans, especially the more ideologically driven ones. And so I'd like the panel to look at that dynamic I lived it in different scenarios. We saw with Harry Reid when he was Speaker, the House goes Republican. He had a complicated dynamic at points in working with Republicans on certain things, causing Democratic discontent in the House. So I'd like to you know, talk, get, if you could expound and, and think through what that might mean in the Senate. And, and well, let, let me start with a comment that Dina made, a very insightful comment in her opening remarks, and that is after like a year, a year the presidential race just sucks up all the oxygen. And Congress loses its ability, basically, to, to message. Would you, that, that was, I think, your point. It's a very wise point. Uh, and, and that's what tends to happen. And you know where Democratic candidates are in, but that, it just it takes everything away. So you really have a year to get something up, get your message out, lay your, your predicate and the like. I noticed that uh, when George Jeffords walked across uh, the aisle, that's when the, the Senate lost the seat, everybody in the Capitol was down except me. As the NRCC chairman, I said, now we have divided government. I understood what that dynamic was, uh, that when you have one party control everything, the, the, the voters generally will give it a rebuke and a, and a balancing. We no longer had that. We had somebody else to blame for our own failures. And so that was, um, uh, you know, that's the way the, 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 the process uh, works. I think that Senator McConnell, who I think is, a, is also an excellent leader, this guy knows, he knows what he's doing. He's going to look after the Senate. It's going to look after that majority that's coming up in 2020, where you have about four or five, six seats that could be competitive. Uh, one Democratic seat likely to pick off in Alabama, but then you, you only have a, a three seat. You can only afford to really lose three seats. Um, and he's going to look after that, I think, to try to preserve it. So even if the Democrats take the presidency on the nomination front, you have a lot of leverage to shape government. Because if you don't, as I said, the governance model is – the president wins, and all he needs is a Senate, and then he packs the courts and, and, and through friendly executive orders and regulations, 
you can do a lot of good or a lot of damage, depending on, on your definition of this. So I think that that's where his focus is going to be, and the House is going to have to fend for itself. Time for one more question. John McLaughlin, uh, in terms of the dream team, uh, who would you really like the Democrats to nominate, and who would you really be upset if they nominate? I t oh, you know, I really miss Hillary. Um, <laughs> I, I hope you go out and see her tour, but you know, it's it's like, I think they're gonna end. Up, I think the person they're gonna nominate is somebody we don't expect, and and it's you can see that in polls that they want somebody younger, they want a new face, and what's really interesting to me is I think if I, my my election expert here is California's moved up their primary right to Super Tuesday. And I think that what in the past is the Democrat Party has decided their nominees as they turn south into South Carolina and Super Tuesday. And that enabled the African-American vote to be a big factor and so that you got Gore, Clinton's, Clinton's Gore, then, then, then you got Barack Obama. He was the nominee. And uh, what the difference is, California now moving into Super Tuesday, they'll be voting in February. And there'll be a lot of delegates that you got to decide, do I campaign in Super Tuesday states or do I campaign in California? And California voters will vote in February by mail as, as Iowa and New Hampshire are going on. So that means we are going to get the most radical open borders, environmental, <laughs> climate change. You're going to get somebody that that's, we can't see right now who's going to take that space. And I'm just waiting for that. I, I'm, just, I, I'm just hoping so who that. who would you rather run against? Who would, who would rather? Let me ask your dream team. Who would you? Who would, who would you rather if run if against? If you're Trump, who do you want to run against? I, I you know, I, I would think uh, it's Hillary. We know we could beat. <laughs> so the question is, you know, I don't think Bernie Sanders is going to get it. I don't think we know who's going to get it, but it's going to be somebody real, a really radical liberal Democrat that D Dina would actually have to say, "Do I want to be a Democrat anymore?" <laughs> so I don't know, but it's it's going to be somebody like that. You know, right now, nobody, because it's really, there's something about Donald Trump where he won the last election. He just willed it. When he's, when he thought about losing, he decided he wanted to win that race, he did it. Donald Trump will do what he needs to do to win the next election, so regardless of who the opponent is. It's, he The more you tell him he's not going to get reelected, this is a guy, they told him he couldn't go from Queens to Manhattan, couldn't rebuild the Walman rink, he couldn't run for president and win. You tell him he can't do something? He'll figure out a way to do it. Can I, can I interject something? I, I just, look, I think the battleground, you take a look at the Democratic coalition. To get 50%, you ha always have some dissonance in your coalition. And if you're Republicans, you're running against the Obama coalition, you you got to pick off a segment of that uh, if everybody shows up or you don't win. I think the most vulnerable se uh, segment for Democrats are going to be where the battleground was this year in these high-income suburbs. Now, Donald Trump, on a cultural basis and appearance basis, doesn't talk to these people. Uh, and I, uh, on a policy basis, though, if, if you were to put up Elizabeth Warren, I'll give you the best example, Fairfax County, where I was head of the county government before I came to Congress and represented it for seven terms. Um, they gave Hillary Clinton 65 percent of the vote. This used to be a Republican county. Uh, we're seeing this ac across the country. But they defeated a meals tax the same day. You start getting an Elizabeth Warren or somebody like that in there. Bernie Sanders got crushed in the primary. These are not progressive. They're socially progressive. But economically, these people make a lot of money. And they like holding on to it. And uh, so I, I do think if somebody goes left on the, really left on the economics, it makes this a battleground. When I talk to my business people who are not Trump people, and I, uh, we, you know, I say, well, what if it's Elizabeth Warren? I say, oh, my, you know. I think that is an opening at that, uh, that, that would be beneficial to the Republican race. And I don't see her taking these rural white voters away from Trump. Got it. And at this point, we're out of time. So thank you so much for the questions. And thanks to the panel for participating. So uh, I just want to, uh, a huge, uh, huge thank to our panelists, a huge thank, thank you to you for braving the bad weather and being such a great, a great audience. And, and I hope uh, we'll be back to partner again with the Hoover Institution to continue this uh, conversation. And, and finally, just join me in thanking the wonderful staffs of the Miller Center and the Hoover Institution. It's made this possible. <laughs>